there was a word you would use to sum up or describe my dad, what would that be for you? Noble, dignity, honest, integrity. Humble. The first word that does come to mind is love. Love. It's definitely just love. I have been, or we shall be, your friend. I mean, come on. Thank you for coming. That was, that was amazing. All the questions I was going to ask were asked in that trailer. So I'm just going to sit here and enjoy the company. Please have your questions ready. This is such a special opportunity, and I love these two guys already. We, uh, we kind of bonded, uh, you know, or the early part of this weekend. Please give a huge round of applause and warm welcome to the two men responsible for this. The film's director, Adam Nimoy, and executive producer, David Zapal. you know, the effort and everything you put in. I've seen this film now a couple of times, and it's so good. You guys, I'm an unbelievable job. Really great. How many of you have seen it? Oh, you must see it. What's, where, where is it right now? How can they see it? iTunes. Go to iTunes. You can download the film uh, right now. How's the response been uh, that you've heard so far? Good. Don't listen to him, it's been great. The um, uh, Rotten Tomatoes were rated 100%, which is unprecedented, actually. Absolutely, yeah, and you've produced a bunch of documentaries for Star Trek, correct? Yes, I, um, I actually started with William Shatner. I don't know if anybody here has seen The Captains, or uh, maybe The Captains uh, Close Up, Get a Life, Chaos on the Bridge. And I said, after all these Star Trek documentaries, I wasn't going to do any more Star Trek documentaries. But then I got a call from Leonard Nimoy. And he said, do you think anybody would be interested in a documentary on Mr. Spock? And I said, are you kidding? So, so wait, so talk to me about the very origins of this. Uh, your idea at first, thinking the 50th is coming up, how did it start? Yeah, it started because my dad and I had made a documentary about his early life in Boston. You know, he grew up in the West End of Boston as the son of Russian immigrants. And we went there together with a camera crew, and I filmed him walking around town reminiscent about his upbringing in Boston. And we, we cut together a half-hour documentary which aired on a local public television station. We had such a great time, it was such a great bonding experience, that I wanted to kind of do it again. I just wanted to replicate it. So. Um, and I knew that we were coming up on 50 years of Star Trek, and there were going to be celebrations all year long, and I suggested to him about making a Spock documentary, and right away he was interested in the idea. Um, he was so enthusiastic, in fact, about making the documentary about Spock that he had done his own research. The second time we had a meeting to talk about the outline of the film, Dad told me he had done some research and Googled Spock's ears. And came up with 150,000 websites which referenced those years. Are you kidding? Yeah, and he just he loved that. He was, you know, he was never jaded by the impact of Spock on popular culture. So um, the other thing that he wanted to make clear about the documentary was that it would be wall to wall Mr. Spock. In other words, this was not going to be a Leonard Nimoy documentary. He was a man of great humility, and he did not want to kind of tout his own uh, success in his career. So we were going to make this film completely about Mr. Spock. But when my father passed away, just three months after we started making this film, developing the film, really, uh, it became clear that we were going to expand it to include the life and legacy of Leonard Nimoy as well. Yeah, and it, it, again, for those who are about to see it, which I'm sure you're all going to want to see it, um, it is, it's really special. It's, it's very personal. I, I just have to thank you for not holding back. There's nothing that I left the film and said, well, I wish they would have talked about this or that, especially with your relationship with your dad. I mean, was anything at the beginning, was that, were you encouraging and you saying, look, if we're going to do this, let's do it right? Yeah, I, I, I mean, Adam was in a very 
difficult position uh, because this story was so personal, but we all knew that what would separate this from any other documentary on Leonard Nimoy is his personal story. And to his credit, he is, is a lot of humility and did not want to be on uh, a focus, but I think you, you can tell it better than I, you came uh, around to the conclusion yeah. that it was the thing to do. Yeah, one of the things that uh, people we were talking about when we were developing the film and we were looking into the life of my dad, and this was actually spearheaded by my stepmother, Susan, she said that I should include my own personal journey with Spock and my dad, that it would make the film unique, that there's so many great documentary filmmakers out there, anybody can really make a film on Spock and let it be one, but nobody could tell my own personal journey. So we did, and I did agree, we would kind of expand the film to include the ups and downs of being in a celebrity family, and some of the turmoil that I kind of went through with my dad, you know, father-son conflict, uh, which I agreed to do, including the film, as a third aspect of the film. In other words, the film is still primarily Spock-centric, and, um, and Leonard Nimoy, you know, uh, emphasized in, in the film. And then third and lastly is kind of the ups and downs of our relationship. And the reason I agreed to do that was because of the fact that the last years of my dad's life, we were very close. We had a big reconciliation. We had been estranged for years. Uh, we found a way to uh, get back together and reconnect, and we had a very strong, loving relationship. Yeah, I mean, for those that, that, that think it's all about this personal relationship, it, it isn't. It's so perfectly balanced between the two, and I think your dad let us all in. Don't you guys feel that way? I mean, Spock, the character let us in. You wanted to know more, you constantly wanted more, and I think your father was the same way. She's so warm and wonderful, and you can see that with the interviews. How did you select the people, you know, to, to interview? Uh, and, and, and did some of them not get in and wanted to? Did you not get people that you, that you wanted to go after? I think you, you wanted desperately to get in. I'm but. just saying, there, there may have been one that was left off the list. Uh, no, I, I, I watched this and I'm like, oh, you guys really come to some amazing people. And the interviews were such that you were talking to them. So there's a personal connection and you look nothing like your dad. So. The first day that I met Adam, he actually said to me, we, we met at Paramount, his dad set up the meeting, and he's, you don't really think I look like my dad, do you? <laughs> said, Have you ever seen a mirror? I want to say, first of all, we, about, before we talk about the people we interviewed, was that my dad suggested that we go to work with Dave Sapone, because Dave had done all these Star Trek-related, Bill Shatner-hosted documentaries, and that Dave could get the job done. But I also have to say that Dave is a walking encyclopedia about Star Trek. He knows everything you need to know about Star Trek, the original series. And I'm also fond of saying that Dave knows a hell of a lot of things that you simply do not need to know about Star Trek, the original series. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. But what, what, who, uh, who'd you go after first? Who would you interview well, first? We, it, we knew we were going to interview the surviving original cast members, and we, got, we have them all in there. I um, mean, obviously, we wanted them to comment about about Spock and about working with Dan. So we were very lucky that everybody uh, was very enthusiastic. And then we wanted to start to talk to the people in the new incarnation of Star Trek, you know, including JJ and the new cast, uh, because Dan had participated in this new incarnation and he felt very strongly and supportive about the cast, uh, about passing the baton to Zachary Quinto. And we went to Vancouver while they were filming Star Trek Beyond. And, and, every, and thanks to JJ and the producers of the film and Paramount, they bent over backwards to make sure that we were able to interview absolutely everybody from that crew. So, and they were amazing to us. I mean, they, they essentially gave us a soundstage in Vancouver, gave us Star Trek sets, built the set for us, and here all of these actors had incredibly stressful schedules, and everybody made found the time to, to come to us and all had such touching stories about Leonard. What was clear is that his presence was really still felt on that set. It was, it was, it was very moving. You know, the interesting thing is that um, you, you interview people that personally had contact, had contact with him. I did not know your dad, yet every time you say dad, when you hear him say dad, don't you feel like it's your dad as well? I mean, I, I, it, 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 when, when people use that term, and it's their father, sometimes I, I, I feel this warmth every time you say it. 
Well, you know, I appreciate you saying that. You know, I mean, he felt, uh, you know, he felt he was the grandfather to the fans. You know, you're all his grandchildren. The, the fact of the matter is, my dad, and we interviewed a lot of fans for this film uh, because it's it's fan based. It's you people all over the world who have supported Star Trek for so many years, and Dad really understood that. And we talk about that also in the film about growing up as a child and trying to get your father's attention and his love when there are so many people all over the planet who want a piece of Leonard and want his attention and love. So let's talk about that for a second, because I have that issue. I have three boys, and, um, you know, when you're out, and you're with your family, and everybody wants to your father, I can't even imagine what that was like growing up. Talk about the good side of that for a second, and then tell me about some, because there are moments when my kids say, can't you just say no? Just say no, and I, and I just I don't feel like I can ever say no, even if it's just to give a sec. I appreciate. I want to, to talk to people. I really do. I love it. But as a child, what was that like? It's complicated, you know, because we couldn't. There was a point in time where I, I was really trying to find. We were trying to find time to spend alone as father and son. And my father took me to a carnival at a, at a local church in our neighborhood. Uh, out on the parking lot to spend some time together, and when we got there, he was mobbed. And that was the first time that it ever had happened. Star Trek had only been on the air for a couple of months. This was probably September, October of 1966. And we had to leave, and it was like that ever after. And, and people, we couldn't even go out to dinner together. People were lining up at the dinner table wanting an autograph. So it changed our lives completely, and that's the downside, you know, the difficulty of being in that kind of situation. And uh, prior to that, you got worked all the time, but I remember in the film to him talking about the fact that he didn't have a job longer than two weeks. So as an actor, you know, you, you, you're worried about your next job. You're like, what's my next job? What's my next gig? And you want to stay relevant. And he was just such a solid actor. I mean, he was just always going to be acting. When he got the call to play Spock, do you remember that as a family, or did he not know? I mean, the first pilot, you know, what, who knows what it's going to be? It's another pilot. Right? Well, the thing that we knew was because when they, in 1964, I was eight years old, I was watching a lot of TV. I was not doing my homework, and I was not practicing clarinet. I was watching, you know, TV. And um, so when Dad came home, I remember distinctly the first time I was exposed to Spock was when he came home with these two Polaroid pictures, one of which I still have, front and back pictures of Mr. Spock in a makeup test. And I was blown away. I just thought, wow, this is going to be, this is incredible. This is going to be great. Um, so we didn't really know what it was until he got on the pilot. And even then we didn't know. That was in 64, and it didn't air. And then they did another pilot in 65. And it really wasn't until 1966 in May when they started filming the first season of Star Trek. And I was there because I was a young kid out of school for summer vacation. Dad was taking me with him to the set that we realized that this was going to be a really big break for him. And what was it like being on the set? I mean, did you spend, were you like over at craft service? Were you running around? There's a, such a sweet moment in the movie when you, you know, you're standing next to your father on the bridge and it's just, it's adorable. Um, was this, and you had ears on as well. <laughs> so were you just loving this? Was this like, you know, a camp for you? Yeah, it was, it was fun. It was like being a Disneyland. You know, they were always trying to get Dad to, to crack up and get out of character. His dad was very focused about being in spa. And it was hard to get him to smile. And Bill Shatner was always a joker. You know, the minute they said cut on the set, Bill turned into just, just Mr. Affable, Mr. Have a Good Time. He was out of character. He was no longer Kurt. But not Dad. Dad was very, you know, very serious about staying a character. So one of the objectives that Bill had was to try to find ways to crack him up, and the rest of the cast as well. So while they were filming this one scene um, from an episode entitled "What Little Girls Are Little Girls," what What's little made? girls made up. Um, Bill is on, Kirk is on the planet uh, surface, and Dad is in the captain's chair, and they're communicating. He's, he gets a message from Captain Kirk. And, the, uh, and while they were rehearsing this, they took me off the set. I was watching them off the set and into the makeup trailer. And Freddie Phillips, who did my dad's makeup every morning, cut my hair, gave me pointed, and shaved my eyebrows, from which they've never really recovered. Uh, and, uh, and then put a pair of dad's ears on me. 
and he took me around to the back of the set. I was in the turbo. And I remember this vividly, buddy. You don't forget this kind of thing at all. But, you know, this is Star Trek hadn't even aired yet, okay? And I remember every step of the way. And then in the middle of the scene, while Dan is communicating with Kirk on the planet, the turbo lift opens, and I walk out and give him a kiss. How great is that? But the That's... funny thing is, we have that clip in the film, and, and you can hear the crew laughing. But Leonard can't see who <laughs> oh, it is. Oh, that's right. And then there's the reveal. It's a, it's Dad a can't see me coming out. The, the weird thing is, and I had never experienced this, that everything on the set is lit up, but everybody watching is in black. You can't see anybody. But all the, everybody is cracking up and laughing about this, and Dad's like, uh huh, okay, you think you got me, uh huh, okay, you know. Because it's just such a common running joke of a way to get Dad to like that. Yeah, and it's, it's that kind of personal story. The, it, the film is so sweet, and yet it is also so incredibly insightful. After all these years, 50 years, you think you know Spock. Honestly, he's, he's let us in, and there's no mystery. There's stuff that just makes you cry, laugh. I laugh through the whole thing. It's just funny and sweet and everything. Um,